All right. You are live. Okay. This looks like it works. All right. Okay. Looks like we're on. Welcome. I'm in the chat. I see our pictures. We're on the thing. It's an excellent connection. Okay. Good stuff. Um, unfortunately, earlier today, we were at the wrong live session. So it didn't allow us to, um, it didn't connect to the link. But we're here now. Welcome. What's going on, Quentin Swift? Hola, Maria. Hey, Xavier. Um, so we're up and running. Let me just we're make alive. sure. Okay. That we disable this other live real quick. Looks like I'm live twice. Just want to make sure. Hola, Maria. Hey, Xavier. Um, so we're up and running. Let me just make sure. Okay. Put your thing on mute, Marla. That we your YouTube able this other nice. live. No, I'm not on mute. Okay. You're, you're on mute. I'm not on mute. Put the YouTube on mute on your computer. Looks like I'm live twice. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay, I've got YouTube on mute. Okay. Yeah, it dropped me on live twice, two different places. I'm gonna. Sorry, technical difficulties. Trying to figure out how to get a guest on. So, just bear with us. And we should be good. Okay. Public live. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome today. We have our special guest, Marla. How are you, Marla? I'm great. Thank you. Yes. Um, Marie says I need better lighting. Hmm. Okay. I think it's my camera. I think I have to switch. Yeah, I don't know, Maria. Sorry. We'll have to figure that out. Can you guys hear us okay? How's our sounds coming in? Yes, Melissa, your tree is growing. <laughs> It is. It's growing. And uh, Xavier, I see you. Quentin Swift, I see you. Eric Canales, Alexander Malm. I see you guys. Marty Blackshire. I see everyone out there. Uh, like I said, trying to figure out how to get this YouTube live with the guests using Zoom. It's a little bit of a challenge, but we got it and we're here. So I'm happy to have Marla. Sound is good. My lighting is bad. Marla, what are we gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do? You need a whole crew, you know. Right. I need a like I need a whole it's studio so and production crew. Like yeah. checking the dials, turning the dials, listening uh, in, radioing and calling, you know, two, I'll send, over. <laughs> send us a crew. Send us a crew. So um better, okay. Alex sees us. Good stuff. Yes. Today, uh, before we get started, I'm gonna just for all of you out here, all GovCon giants, we are going to have tomorrow's call Tuesday. Um, and I was telling Marla about it, what we're going to do. We are going to have a happy hour for all of our GovCon people. And we're going to celebrate everyone's wins. And we're going to celebrate the wins, what you earn, and we're going to celebrate what you learn. So... Tomorrow, all of our GovCon Giant students, we will be having a happy hour on our Tuesday calls tomorrow. So bring whatever bubbly stuff you like. It doesn't matter. It's BYOB, and we will be joining us to discuss the wins for the month, what everyone learned moving forward. So again, uh, we're happy. Oh, look at that. Ace Branch. Evans, what's up, brother? Um, welcome. One girl, one truck. I see you, Teddy. Yes, tomorrow should be exciting for everyone out there. I can't wait. So don't expect to learn nothing, but expect to be super, super inspired, super, super motivated, 
We have all of our people. That we're expecting all of you to be here. If your name is on this list, you better show up. So we're expecting everyone to be here. But today, today, Marla. Oh, by the way, before we get started, as always, make sure you put in here the city that you're from, the industry that you're in. Use this as your official meet and greet. Use this as your networking session. We're here every Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. We actually, my podcast guest today, which is Judy, my friend Judy over here, okay, she just released her second book. I fully support and endorse it. It's Government Contracts Made Easier. First time I've ever endorsed anyone's material, by the way, anyone's book. But Judy, I, as you can see here, like, I mean, I really went through all of her stuff and, um, it was it was a, it's a really good interview. I mean, she actually teared up, Marla. Believe it or not, she was passionate. She said, "Eric, the, you know that's some of the best compliments that I can get for writing that book was that when someone has marks and white paper stuff." So, uh, really good stuff. But you know, Judy came out and she talked about again, and and this is this is what we I just I can't I'm gonna look. Y'all can start calling me Preacher Eric because we're going to have to keep preaching to y'all the importance of relationships, relationships. And Judy said, hey, she definitely, uh, for her, it, she, with the kind of companies that she likes to work with, those people who have already are ready to go and they've made the commitment to invest in developing some bounds ahead of everyone out there. And the same thing for me. In fact, I'll share with you a really quick success story today. And I think Maria, I, I want to just share this quote from Judy's website. I'm pulling it up. Um, I thought this was really cool. Where is it at? Let me find it. Okay. I thought this was really cool. Let me share this. Oh, dang it. Sorry. I'm trying to figure out. Um... Well, since I can't share my screen because I'm doing something funny with Zoom, I will just read it to you. And what what she says on her website, growfedbiz.com, is uh, there's no such realizing that the needs of the clients are inside of these databases, right? Their fears are not in there. We discuss what happens when you're working with a contracting officer. It's their first year on the job. What happens when you work with someone who's it's their 25th year? Are they looking for the exit to go out the door? Understanding that is critical to having success in this industry. And that's one of the things that we definitely try and push and we talk about all the time. Um, but again, I'm looking in the chat. I don't see enough people telling us where they're from and what they do. So again, um, definitely put that in the chat on here. Flint, Michigan. Darren Gardner, Benita Springs. I see some trucking folks on here. Eight weeks out, so you won't see these or hear these for December or January of next year. So we, you know, we have a lot of people in front of that. But um, it's six oh nine. Like she said to me earlier, Eric, you, you, you know, I do this every week. She gets one shot at it, so I don't want to steal her thunder. Definitely want to let her come on and tell you all about herself and what she's doing. Hi, thank you, Bridget, for joining us from Canada. Um, I can tell you, Nancy, Dallas, Texas, freight broker, welcome. My oh, man, Xavier. <laughs> Xavier recognizes uh, one girl, one truck. Talking about FEMA loads. Detroit, Michigan, okay. All right, North Carolina. So it looks like we've got a lot of trucking people tonight. So Marlon. Yes. Where did you come from? <laughs> so I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. Uh -huh. I live in Las Vegas right now, though. Uh, so I started off. You want to tell me about? Why don't you want me to tell you about my career? Just how I got into this whole ISO thing. Sure. Want to hear about that? All right. So I started off in the automotive industry in Detroit because that's what we do in Detroit. We either sing or we make cars, and I chose to make cars. So I started off at the Dearborn stamping plant. I see there's a lot of Detroit people on there. And I was a line foreman. Absolutely hated the job. Within six months, I told my boss, look, I'm out of here. 
This is what I, this is not what I went to college for. I'm out. He said, why don't you go over to quality and see what they're doing? And at the time they were getting their ISO certification. It was actually called QS 9000 back then. So I hung out with that auditor for about three months and absolutely loved it. So I asked the guy, I said, look, what do I need to do to get your job? Because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And he said, well, you've only got like three months of experience. So you need to get more experience. So I went on to become a quality manager uh, in automotive, did that for about 13 years or so. Then the automotive industry started to tank. So I moved to Vegas, joined the Department of Defense, worked for a prime contractor for about 13 years. And that's when I got introduced to that AS9100 certification for aerospace. Did that for a little while. Then I went to a medical device company and they had their own standard. It's called ISO 1345. So got all this information, got all of this uh, experience with being audited and auditing other companies and decided after about, I don't know, 24 years, I got enough. So I became a consultant. So now I use all that experience to kind of take the fear out of this whole ISO thing. And I help other companies get ISO certified or get ready for their certification. Nice. I like it. I like it. Um, today, what are we... Um... So what are we going to talk about today? So today, we're just going to give, like you said, a mastermind class. What is ISO? Why do we need this? Uh, what's it going to do for you? And how do you fail an audit? I'm sure there's a lot of videos out there on how to pass an audit. I'm going to tell you how to fail one. <laughs> I like that. Right? How to fail an audit. I All like right. That. So um, I don't know if I can share my screen. I have a couple of slides. I, I have your you slides can, up. You can do it. If you look at, I mean. All right. So I have, because I, because of the window thing, I don't mess up. So I have your, what is ISO? Now I have advanced quality, Marla, Marla Nelson, ISO, what's your phone number on it? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So what is ISO 9001? First, uh, it's an international standard that is just based on uh, <laughs> several world-class business standards. So wait, we're doing the intro, right? Marla Nelson, ISO. Lee oh, Lyon. you just saw it come up? <laughs> I can tell. See, it's a lag. So you got to, yeah, it's a lag. But don't worry about it. If you just keep talking, look, I work for you tonight. So you talk and you tell me when to slip, click the slides and I'll be your clicker. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So let's get back to this. So ISO 9001. So it is, it was created back in 1987. It was actually in, in, uh, in the works before that, but it really got launched in 1987. It's an international standard and it's basically based on about seven world-class business practices. And it represents a risk-based approach to business excellence. So instead of just winging it, thank you, instead of just winging it and hoping that you produce the parts and, and offer the services that your customer wants, you have a very disciplined approach to how you uh, put your processes together, how you document them, and how you provide excellence that you're meeting all requirements. So it's not necessarily a requirement for all companies, but it really does send the message that you aren't just a mediocre average company. You are an excellence company and you have the ability to meet all customer requirements. Okay. And there's another misnomer there. We say ISO 9001 is actually created by the International Organization of Standards. So it's like IOS for some reason, but back in the day we couldn't say IOS, but we did IOS. Mm. You can go to the next slide, Eric. Okay. Hold on. I'm messing you up over here. Yeah. And I'm hoping people will ask questions too, because I'm sure there are a lot of people who have had some experience with it. Some have had nightmares with this. I want to try to, you know, clear up some of these myths on how terrible it is or how easy it is. Uh, and just answer whatever questions people have. Okay. Where to start? All right, so we're going to talk about where to start. The first thing is that we have to figure out what standard makes sense for your business. So ISO 9001 is the basic. That's what all of the other standards are based on. Okay, So any kind of manufacturing, any kind of service, it doesn't matter what it is. You could be a barber shop, you could sell fertilizer, you can make candy. You can provide staffing services. It really doesn't matter. Everybody can benefit from ISO 9001. Now, if you very specifically want to get into aerospace or provide other military type products or services, AS 9100 might be the right standard for you. 
And if you're into medical devices, you know, the whole N95 mask and all the sterile PPE and all that, that's hot right now. So you have a lot of startup companies that are starting to make these masks and uh, or even just distribute these masks, buying them from somewhere else. ISO 1345 is very specific to medical devices. So now, that might be a way to go. Now, let me ask you something. Now, I'm going to stop you real quick, yeah. Marla. Yeah. Now, how does that apply to us with PPE? I don't, I don't really understand that. So, so we have to manufacture the PPE. Somebody has to make it. Okay. Okay. So we already know that an N95 mask is very different than just the normal paper surgical mask that some people wear, right? right. It's two different things. Right. In order for it to be an N95 mask, there are very, very strict standards and regulations that it has to meet in the manufacture of that product, okay. materials that are used. So when you have a standard like ISO 1345, it helps to make sure that you meet those requirements. Mm, okay. Okay. Now, okay. that's if I want to be a manufacturer. Uh huh. Okay. Or a distributor, and I'll tell you why. Because of medical devices are a little different than other products. Is if you think about it, you could kill somebody or harm somebody if you have a medical device out there that is uh, non-conforming, it's got defects, or something's wrong with it, right? right. So you think about when you buy something, you're going to go to who you bought it from. If you're just a distributor, they're coming to the distributor, even though you didn't make it. They wow. bought it from you. So you have so distributors have regulations as well when they're dealing with medical devices. Interesting. They have responsibility. Okay, keep going. That was good. All right. Now, if you're in a more creative and innovative type of industry like cannabis. Hey. Industry, CBD oil, and I have some clients like that. It's fantastic. Uh, tattoo ink and some uh, cosmetics. So you would think that the FDA would be all over that. Well, right, right now they're not. Get so what, yeah, what a lot of those industries are doing, they follow something called good manufacturing practices. That's also based on ISO 9000. So good manufacturing practices are based on ISO mm -hmm. 9000? Absolutely. Actually, almost except for the last one, CMMC, all of these are based on ISO 9001. That's the granddaddy of them all. I think um, I, I'm I'm going to let you finish this slide, but I'm definitely curious to come back to this cannabis thing. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Go ahead and finish the slide with CMMC. Sure, no problem. So the new hotness right now is CMMC because we all are having issues with cybersecurity. Um, I mean, how many people get hacked, how many businesses are getting hacked, data breaches, all this kind of stuff. So if you're going to do business with the Department of Defense, the DOD, and you're going to be handling uh, some of their information, like transferring it back and forth, uh, you're going to have to get CM CMMC certified pretty soon. A lot of companies are already on this road, uh, but that's the new thing that's come up now. Now... Is that just, uh, do you help with that? No, I have a partner that helps with that. Okay. I stay far away from anything IT related. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> but I have partners for that. Okay. Yes. All right. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Are you good? So back to cannabis. Okay. Um, no, so on the cannabis thing, tell mm -hmm. us now, you said the FAA is not regulating it. Uh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, just drop them in a chat. Um, yeah. We'll take in all your questions. But uh, on the cannabis, you said the FAA is not regulating it. Right, let me just pull the slide back right. up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. FDA, sorry. I, mm -hmm. I get my contracts confused with my compliance agencies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then everyone has acronyms. So, uh, But there are people who are in our group that are interested in cannabis, right? And I know that the government is potentially experimenting with cannabis mm -hmm. um so what you're saying uh, tell us what do you, how, how does okay mm -hmm. if i'm in that space and i want to do business with the government what do you think that i need to do what are the, some of the first things that i need to do all right so if you're going to manufacture this stuff right okay like you're cooking it up and I, I hate to use that term but you're cooking it up and you're trying to sell it to the to the public you need to have some controls in place so since it's not regulated right now by the FDA, technically, 
I could be in my kitchen with a crock pot and a hot plate making CBD oil. And as long as I send it to a lab and it passes whatever the requirements are, I can sell it. But as a consumer, wouldn't you be concerned about how something was made? Don't you want to know if they burned down a plant in order to make <laughs> make the little vial yeah. that you're looking for, whatever it is? So the good manufacturing practices just make sure that um, you have real production equipment and not a hot plate, that you have work instructions and procedures. So when you're making it, it's consistent and doesn't have a lot of variability. You don't want to just put all this stuff together in a cauldron and hope it comes out the same every time. Mm. You need to have some discipline in your process. A good manufacturing pra practices kind of puts a framework around that. Okay. There's some questions out here. I'm going to take questions. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Who? Okay. We, we've identified, are there certain industries outside of manufacturing um, and distributors? So people are asking, you know, do you see a lot of construction companies with ISO certification? So it depends on what part of construction you're doing. So any any kind of service, we would call it a service industry. Yes, anybody can get ISO certified. Absolutely. If you feel that you need it. Now, yes, manufacturing for sure. But if you are providing staffing, for instance, to the government, they're, they're trying to get physicists or something like that, you can use ISO. Construction very specifically, maybe, right. maybe. It doesn't come up that often, right. for me, anyway. Right. Now, so what, what, what would a person that was providing staffing, what would they, why would they need ISO? All right, so let's say um, you have a government contract and that's all you're doing is, is recruiting, okay? When you recruit for the government, there are usually security protocols, there's security clearances, there's certain training, you have to vet it. I mean, we've all, we've all met people who have a, a really beautiful resume, mm -hmm. and then when you interview them, it's all fake, right? So you have to have some pretty tight controls on how you put the requirements out there for who you need, how you vet these people, and once they get on the contract, if they've been vetted, what do you do if they don't meet the requirements? What if the, the government contracting officer doesn't like that guy? What if he doesn't perform? What if he's late every day? What do you do about that? So when you have a disciplined process approach to what you're doing and how you're meeting customer requirements, then you, it really does put you on a different level. And it, it assures your customer that you can meet their needs consistently and they don't have to worry about it. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. Someone says, what about selling additives? Like additive manufacturing? Yeah, additive, like yeah, additive manufacturing parts of DOD or NSA. Absolutely. So I actually have two clients that do additive manufacturing. Um, what is additive manufacturing? All right. So we used to call it 3D printing. So you would just program something into this machine, feed in a bunch of plastic or some other material, and automatically it just it makes something for you. Okay. A lot of companies are going this route because it's a cheaper way to make prototypes. Okay. It's uh, uh, if you were making like metal parts or glass parts or something like that, it might be really expensive to create a sample so that you can demonstrate what you're trying to do. With the additive manufacturing, it's sometimes a less expensive, more efficient way to do a uh, high speed or, or quick turnaround for rapid prototypes. That's what a lot of music for. But um, it's, it's taken off quite a bit. Uh, where you would get like a bunch of little washers of nuts and bolts and screws and things like that. It used to be made out of metal. Sometimes it doesn't have to be. Sometimes those fasteners can be made out of some other material and get 3D printed or additive manufactured. Why, why do they change it from 3D printing to additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing just sounds better. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It almost seems like all you're doing is making toys, you know. Like I know the first time I saw it, somebody made a Yoda doll. I, yeah, awesome. but I mean, I guess yeah. The first time I saw it, someone was making well, someone was making actually uh, uh, hands. So people that didn't have hands and limbs, they were making body parts and components. Um, sure, absolutely. I get it. I, I understand. Yeah, and it's an evolving. It's emerging and evolving. Used to be kind of just like plastic and rubber when it first started. Now. 
Uh, there are things that they're making with additive manufacturing. You wouldn't be able to tell if it was metal or not. That's a good point. Uh, let's see questions. What else we have out here? Um, Darner Gardner, I'm not sure what you're saying, but I have 30 search with 28 years experience. I don't know what that means. 30 search is a lot. 30, like, like companies. So, okay. That's kind of, if, if I understand that right, what Darren Gardner is saying. Uh, so we, we get certified to our processes, our organizations, our companies get certified, not products. I think a lot of people kind of get that confused. They're like, oh yeah, my products are awesome. They're ISO certified. Your products are not ISO certified. Your processes to make the product are uh, certified. And your company is certified. Ah, uh, that's, you know, because th that person asked a construction question. I had a friend of mine who was a construction contractor that had ISO. He claimed that on his website and stuff like this. And he was able to use that to partner with a larger firm on a construction contract. And I couldn't mm -hmm. figure out, like, what does ISO have to do with anything? So mm -hmm. that makes sense now what you just said. Can you please repeat that for all of us who didn't get it? About sure. The 30 certs? So, sure. When you get ISO certification, you're not certifying your product. You're certifying the process and the organization. So it's showing that you have the ability to meet your customer requirements. Okay. Okay. No, that makes that makes a big difference. Can you give us an example of a process that you would certify? Uh, absolutely. So almost every company out there, regardless of what the industry is, has purchasing. Purchasing, procurement, supply chain management, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So with ISO, just as a basis, you, you can't just go to Google every time you need raw material. You need to have approved, preferred, vetted suppliers uh, to choose from. Uh, if you have critical components or something like that, you have to have some kind of criteria that you're using to say, I'm going to use Acme parts all the time because they have an ISO certification. They have excellent a reputation with quality and on-time delivery and things like that. So with purchasing an ISO, you typically have something called an approved supplier list. Government uses that all the time. They might call it a preferred vendor list. They, they call it different things, but they're not just going to Google whenever they want to find something. They're going to their preferred folks. So every year when you are certified, you need to evaluate your existing suppliers. Uh, are you using them just because they're the only ones there? Yeah, that's possible. Or are you choosing to keep and to stay in business with them? Okay. Uh, what I push my clients is if you do have a critical supplier, like you're the only people in the world that make this thing and they're in Taiwan, that's fantastic until COVID hit. Mm. Now you're stuck. <laughs> and what are you going to do? So a lot of them are really trying to come up with alternatives. And it's not always made in the USA. Sometimes it is. That's one alternative. Some of my companies are pivoting and starting to manufacture the stuff themselves. They said, you know what? We're not going to outsource it at all. We're going to do it ourselves. I like that. I like that. I think right now with uh, there's a tremendous opportunity to start manufacturing everything back in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the administration that's in place today. So I, I'm, I see that happening. I know for a fact that we actually, uh, we have a YouTube video where we put out, there was a request for people who want to manufacture certain items that the government was looking for, and they were going to be supporting it. Uh, so I see a lot of money thrown at that. Tell us, let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's, before we continue, let's just finish up your slides that you have, mm -hmm. and then we'll continue on the conversation. Okay, that sounds good. By the way, I, I, for everyone out there listening, definitely ask questions. Uh, let, let us know what you think. Give us feedback. Put it in the chat because once we finish the presentation, I'll be going back, taking questions, and continuing this conversation with Marla. I can tell you I love this stuff. As you see, I'm a student of the game. I'm still learning, always learning. And uh, this is an area where I could really use some help in because as a person who's interested in investing and companies that manufacture things. In particular, Marla's helping me now try to identify some potential companies that I, I want to invest in. Uh, this is going to be critical to my next steps for, for myself as a government contractor. So this uh, particular topic is right on time for me, and uh, I have great interest in it, and I hope that those folks who 
have potential manufacturing partners, uh, resources, because our government is making a push for Buy USA, they're being they're starting to um, make those initiative, the Barry Act compliances, they're starting to put those things back into contract language and and look at them and look for them. We're going to see a lot more of this happening. And again, like I tell you guys, I teach you to be proactive, not reactive. You want to get ahead of the curve and understand how you can best utilize this, this knowledge and information that you're gaining here to take advantage, mm -hmm. to, to jump in on some opportunities. Uh, those of you may know that I am working on some upcoming stuff with FEMA. I'm not going to share it publicly, but the people inside of our, our Tuesday calls kind of know what I'm talking about. They have an idea. Uh, please don't post it or type it <laughs> in the chat to, to prove that you know me. Uh, but we are working on some stuff, and this all of this comes into play. And so this is very exciting. So definitely pay attention because, as we all know it, and Marla gave the example with the whole COVID-19 and the pandemic, there are a lot of opportunities because the supply chains have been cut off from overseas. Uh, there are people who are fighting amongst each other, countries. Uh, Europe cut us off at some point from supplies. Uh, so when the European nation did that, then we, again, us as Americans decided, hey, look, we probably want to have much more control over this. We that we saw how uh, extra fast the problem was in terms of size, scale, and scope. When we had our shortages for everything from masks to gloves to sanitizer. So I, I really do believe that this is something, this is very forward thinking conversation. And those persons who can read between the lines will see how I'm setting you up for success in 2021, 2022. Don't wait until the boat has shipped and sailed to try to be like, oh, that's what he was talking about back then. Okay, this is something that you need to get ahead of right now, today. We all have manufacturing facilities that are closed down, shut down in our cities and towns all around us in USA everyday USA America. So listen, learn, pay attention, figure out how you can get your father-in-law, cousin-in-law, who was an ex-machinist, who was a welder. I mean, all of our ancestors had these trades back in the days. Like Marla said, she worked um, on the line work, and we've had some people make some comments about that. So we have people that we know that have these trades, that have these skill sets that Again, I'm sure that they want to utilize their brain and all their knowledges and experiences for good. Let's help them to do that. All right, Marla, you're on. Sure. So uh, one thing before I get into that slide, where this comes up in this group where I saw it, uh, so I focus on machine shops. So I was working over in the DLA trying to figure out, okay, can I find an opportunity uh, for the machine shops and uh, uh, just find some purchasing opportunities for them? In the solicitation, in the qualifications, or in the scoring, a lot of times you'll see AS9100 preferred or ISO uh, compliance required or something like that. So you can uh, set up a quality management system with an awesome consultant such as myself uh, and not actually get certified. But from what I read, the government doesn't always require, doesn't always require this certification, but they need for you to have your quality management system set up, that you have the ability. Mm, okay. so that brings us to this slide. Uh, my consultant rocks. Why can't she certify me? So there are rules to this game. Okay. If I'm your consultant, I can't come in and help you create your quality management system, define your processes. Uh, do an internal audit, like a pre-audit, train everybody and make sure everything's great, and at the same time, hand you a pretty piece of paper that says, yes, you're certified. So your consultant will help create and establish your quality management system and train the team and all of that, but then the registrar or certif certification body will come in and actually grant the certification. Mm. There's always a check. So some people get a little confused by that. But if you just want to get compliant, if you just want to establish a quality management system, you can just use a consultant for that and be compliant. Okay. Um, so you're going to come in and help me establish this, and then we'll have a third party come in and mm -hmm. and, and check it and make sure it's legit. Mm -hmm. Well, that, to right. me, I'm fine with that because I, um, 
I trust you anyway, so I would. <laughs> I don't want to hire you to come out and audit it. I need you to help me create it. Mm-hmm. Because I'm going to audit you anyway. <laughs> I'm going to audit you, and I, I pride myself on being tougher than the certification bodies. I love it when they come into my clients and they have nothing to do. They're looking for stuff. They'll they'll nitpick something like, oh, well, I see your consultant had a typo on this page. I'm like, tell them to write it up. Please write it up. <laughs> if that's all they found, we'll take it. Okay. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So last slide, how to fail a certification audit. How to fail. Go ahead. All right. So a lot of folks um, have had some bad experiences with ISO over the years because it used to be a whole mass of paper. It was just horrible, didn't mean anything. It was kind of disconnected. Uh, and, and people just have this bad taste in their mouth. Well, it's a lot easier now. It's it's more flexible. It's more adaptive. Uh, it works for all industries. But there are still people out there who try to do it the old school way. So this is how you fail. If you assume that somebody, because they're the quality manager, that it's their job to do it because it's quality, that's, that's just a mistake. It's a mistake. One of the first questions that they're going to ask you in your certification audit, it's, it's called a leadership interview. They want to know, how is the leadership making sure that everybody has the resources that they need to be effective? How does the leadership uh, let everybody understand, help everybody understand that they contribute to the effectiveness of the business? So uh, it's not just the quality manager, even though that person might coordinate it all. Every single person in the company is subject to being audited for different reasons, from the president to whoever actually does the work in the company. Not to say the presidents don't work, but you know what I mean. <laughs> the next thing- We heard that job, that, we heard that job. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, to pre- just, so don't prepare for the audit, just wing it. And look, this is just like a business meeting. I've been doing this my whole career. I'll just wing it. That's what you don't wanna do because you're gonna be wasting the auditor's time. And that's, that's one of the things they don't like. If they ask you a question and you have no idea what they're talking about because you haven't read the standard, you haven't prepared for this, you're going to make their job harder. And it also puts pressure on the rest of the team because remember, it's not one person being audited. It's the entire company. So if you're winging it, that means everybody else is winging it. And everybody doesn't like to be audited. I'm probably the only oddball out there that likes to be audited because I know how to prepare for it. So don't wing it. Always be prepared. Uh, arguing your philosophy on why some of these requirements don't make any sense. Now, I'm being facetious there. Your auditor will enjoy a healthy debate. Not true. Not true. It really doesn't matter if you think the context of the organization is stupid. It doesn't mean anything. All it means or all it tells the auditor is that you haven't read the standard and you don't know what it is. So, Eric, I think uh, just a few weeks ago on one of your podcasts, you talked about a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, Mm -hmm. right? That essentially is the context of the organization. That is a requirement that we have to document in ISO 9001 and in AS 9100. I didn't know that. Right. So don't argue with the auditor. The answer to every single question is yes, and here's the documentation. (laughs) Yes, and here is the evidence. And lastly, don't think that you can go on the internet and buy ISO in a box where somebody's going to put together a lot of really cool looking documents and it doesn't mean anything, doesn't represent your company at all or your business uh, and think you're going to pass the audit. Okay, All the documents that you create are supposed to represent your actual business practices. So if you have a work instruction that says, I put all rejects in this corner and put it on red paper with green ink. Your auditor is going to go to the floor, be looking for rejects on red paper with green ink. And if it's not, you're, you're violating your own policy. And they might write you up for that. You might get a finding for that. Those are the things I really see. And it, I, I don't have any of my clients failing audits. That typically does not happen. But as a consultant, I've certainly been hired to fix the terrible work of, of other consultants. <laughs> And I've also been hired to fix uh, quality management systems where they did fail the first audit and they lost a bunch of money and they need to get it together quickly. um, Give us some industries that your clients are in, the types of clients that you've worked with, 
Um, mm -hmm. Just give us kind of some background so we have an idea. Sure. So, of course, on the manufacturing side, you have machine shops, you have die casting shops, um, automotive manufacturers, uh, definitely CBD oil, candy, fertilizer, tattoo ink is a big one for some reason. Uh, <laughs> a lot of staffing agencies. Um, who else am I using? Uh, just trying to think, it's pretty much anything. I mean, if you manufacture anything, you got that. I have a, a company that does the masks, that does aprons. Like you go to the dentist and you put those um, radiation aprons on, they make those. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, just a little bit of everything. Plastic connectors, wiring harnesses, anything. Absolutely anything. And as a consultant, you don't have to be an expert in whatever that product is. Okay. You just have to know the standard, kind of like with government contracting and right. consulting. You don't have to know the whole industry, but you need to know government contracting in order to help other people. Right. No, that makes sense. That's a good point. I like that. I like that metaphor. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, is this the best way for people to reach you at this website, aqpnv.com? Yep. That stands for Advantage Quality Professionals Nevada.com. Okay. All right. I put it back up on the screen for everyone out there. Mm -hmm. We will uh, open up for questions. I see some questions in here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Darren says it's 30 tech search, but he would like to get ISO 9001. Are there any ISO certifications needed to procure solar panels for the Department of Energy or DOD? So, again, we don't certify products. Right. So, if if he is manufacturing or his client is manufacturing those, probably ISO 9001. Right, right. They, that was that uh, that question um, I was responding to, Deji. That was your question. So, okay. makes sense. If so, if again, if you are providing the actual solar panels to the Department of Energy mm -hmm. as a manufacturer, then yes, it makes sense to do mm -hmm. it. Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Scott Gordon has a question. I've been using suppliers to manufacture products for my company. There's an opportunity in which, if one, my company would be manufacturing in-house. This has caused a pause button on the award since we have not manufactured in-house before and they do not want to risk this on us. Any advice? Yeah, so that's a perfect situation where you need to get compliant. If you can show that you have a quality, an established quality management system, you have already aligned all of your business processes with these world-class uh, activities, then you'll probably have a better chance at it. Now, I've had clients who are startups. They've never done anything. They don't even have clients yet. So what we do is simulate. So I had a couple of guys that were welders. They said, hey, we want to do ship repair. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, who are your clients? Well, we don't have any yet. Where's your welding equipment? Well, we haven't decided to do that yet. I said, then find one of your buddies who has a ship, a boat, a yacht, a canoe, whatever, and go do some welding. But we simulated the whole thing. I said, write up a, a quote, have them do a request for quote. You do a quote. You're going to buy raw materials so you can, you can use your um, purchasing process and show us how you do that. You're going to do receiving inspection because you're going to buy, uh, sorry, you're going to get the uh, receive parts in. You're going to rent your welding equipment, so now you have an outsourced supplier, so you can demonstrate that. You're going to actually do the work, and I'm sure there's a work instruction. There's going to be an inspection. You may have to have a sign-off by your customer. So you can really simulate the whole thing. So for this startup, and I'm going to call them a startup, because they say they haven't done manufacturing yet. Mm -hmm. They can still get compliant, but I would definitely recommend that they at least simulate manufacturing something. Scott, does that make sense to you? I hope that it does. Um, I have a question here. Aiden, hello, I'm 13 years old. Let's see. I really want to become a contract of watching War Dogs in order to build because I watch most of the videos, but I'm confused. Um, well, Aiden, first of all, I, I, if you are a real person, because again, we're in the days of robots and bots and everything else. Uh, if you're a real person, Congratulations for 13 years old being interested in government contracting. Uh, we do have a story of a 16 year old who was winning government contracts. Uh, you probably watched that video if you watch my content. Definitely, um, Wesley's doing it. 
I would, if I were 13, I would try and connect with Wesley, who's 16, because Wesley, his staff are all high school students and teenagers. So to me, uh, that would be the first place I would start is by connecting with someone that was more along my, my age to see what they were doing. But I would use Wesley as a great example of where you could start. He actually started at 15 um, doing government contracting. He's now 16. And then he started a car club at 14 at his local school. So if you go back and watch that interview with Wesley, uh, you guys are probably around the same age where you start having that entrepreneurship mind. And again, at 13, I had an entrepreneur mind, so I definitely understand and I appreciate it. And I want to encourage you. So what I would do is say, hey, reach out to Wesley. He's on Instagram. If you send us an email, we can connect you with him. I have his email address as well as his other contact information. That would be the place I'd start. All right. I want to say something about Wesley. I was referring to him as a 16-year-old that punked us all. When I watched that video, I said, I'm obviously not working hard enough. Clearly, I'm not. <laughs> so he was definitely inspirational to all of us. Okay. Um, so Aiden says, I'm real. Wesley, I can't find his email. Yeah, just send us an email at service at GovCon Giants, and then we will send, we can send you Wesley. So drop us an email. Hold on. Uh, send an email there, service at GovCon Giants. We'll connect with Wesley. Also, the way that I was able to reach him was through his Instagram page. So if you go back to the clip with him on IG, um, you could always DM Wesley, and he's like, he responds. That's how I got him. I, we didn't have any information for him. We just went to his IG. We sent him. A, we DM'd him, and we connected. Uh, and again, like I said, he has two other teenagers working for him. So maybe the one's fifteen. I don't know. But I think that's a great place to get some, you know, to have a conversation because I think you're you're all on the same path. And um, he could probably share some things with you that, you know, an old guy like me couldn't. So. <laughs> uh, that's where I would start. All right, questions. Uh, yes. Young okay. Swiss, go ahead. Question here by say, is there a different ISO for assembled versus manufactured? The, the answer is no. ISO 9001 works for all of it. Whether it's assembled, manufactured, whether you're distributing, whether you're warehousing, it all works. Okay. What about... Um, Above that, yes, I agree. I hope made in the USA becomes a standard, not a trend. It used to be the standard, but then we started letting stuff go. We started waiving requirements. We started uh, finding loopholes. So Scott Gordon says, yes, this makes sense. We're ISO compliant. We've been working with them for six years. I'll put together a plan and simulate the machining process to see if that will work. Yeah. And Scott, yeah. by the way, um, I know that you're very active. I've seen some of the comments that you've made on YouTube. Reach out to Marla. Marla is a GovCon giant. She's not just a speaker coming out here to speak to people out here. She's actually part of the community. Uh, she's, you know, she's part of our family. So we, she's team giants all the way. Uh, she sits on those Tuesday calls. In fact, we were just talking beforehand. And Marla, just, just tell people what you're saying in terms of uh, being inside and meeting people and connecting with other folks. Um, just kind of mention that when we were talking about offline before we got started. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I got into government contracting or, you know, just got the idea for it, just like a lot of you. But getting in there, I'm going through the classes, I'm doing the steps. But the biggest benefit that I'm getting is networking with people who I wouldn't normally network with. Right. Um, I used to do conferences. I'm afraid of traveling at the moment. <laughs> but prior to that, I used to do networking events. I used to do that stuff all the time. But now with COVID, we can't do that. So what better place to be is in a room or on a Zoom with almost 100 people who have the same focus and ideas and, and, and a vision that you have. Right. That's fantastic. And there's always something, even though we're kind of in different industries, there's always a common thread. And it works. It works well. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think, and I've said this to Maria, I've said this to our team, um, in, the, in the near future, and you, you're saying it now, but I think that's going to be the, the, the biggest component of, of our community is going to be the community itself. Um, with having, again, Chris, my buddy Chris, won that $21 million IDIQ yesterday. Um, with having Shakarat won her contract over in Africa. 
we're going to be connected in all industries across the planet and and be able to, to have all of us in one room together on the same page is just going to be incredible. And so I can't wait. I'm excited. But I agree. I do think that that's going to be where that's going to be the, 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 the most uh, advantageous piece of joining is the community. So, um, the community is pushing me to think outside of the box as well, yeah. <laughs> which I like. I'm like, what about trucking? <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Well, I'm learning. Sure. That's sure you're learning. That's fine. Um, Aiden, yes, you can send me a Gmail. That's fine. Uh, Mo says, where's a good place to network with manufacturers? Uh, in GovCon Giants. <laughs> <laughs> Mo, Mo, Mo is in GovCon, but he doesn't always come on those Tuesday calls. He comes on sp sporadically, Marla. Mm -hmm. See? All so, right. Mo, you got to start coming back to the Tuesday meetings. Yeah, we can talk. I mean, as I mentioned before, I'm involved with a lot of different types of manufacturers. Right. So it just depends on what kind of manufacturer. But I, I probably have a hookup on whoever you're trying to talk to. Yeah, I can tell you this, Mo. Uh, like I said, um, I'm looking for some manufacturers right now, myself personally, um, because, again, that's where I'm evolving as a contractor is I want to start owning uh, the things. So, I, you know, it's great. I started off doing construction. I then I did consulting. Um, but now I, I want to build and I want to own stuff that I then sell to the government and I want to have my name stamped all over it. Um, so that's an area that I'm looking at evolving into. And so, Mo, yeah, I definitely reached out to Marla and she's helping me with that. Let's see. Thank you, ma'am. Premier ISO 9001 when I worked at Ford. Now I want to learn more diligent certification in the federal market arena. Okay. Um, I see Excel on here. Let's see. Marie's excellent consultant. Very open. Being a CEO is lonely at times, so having a tribe helps. Yes. By the way, because I see some of my GovCon people on here, we are on for tomorrow. Maria may not have sent out the email. I don't know. Maybe she did because I can't check my email and talk. But tomorrow we are on. We're celebrating our earned and learned. So the people that earn, we're going to have them on telling us their story. And the people that learn, we're going to talk about their story and what they learned this past year. So we're going to bring in our GovCon New Year's, since it's the New Year's for government contracting industry. We're going to bring in it there. So we will do tomorrow Tuesday call. It's just going to be different than our traditional way of calling, where we will have more of a happy hour. So again, um, if you drink apple seltzer or cider, <laughs> that's fine. We don't mind. But yeah, we're going to be celebrating our wins tomorrow on Tuesday's call. Let's see. All right, Mebs is in the building. Awesome detail. Mo's going to jump on. Um, Young Swoops, ownership is the key. Janice Holloway. All right. Looks like uh, Marla, looks like you, you stole the show. They don't have any questions for you. <laughs> All right. Well, they might be scared or they don't know what to ask. They're probably scared, <laughs> Marla. So just what, reach out. What are some of the, what are the, some of the, what are some of the questions that people ask about this? If I'm, um, let's say, for example, let, let's just go through a scenario. Uh, let's say I'm looking to buy and you know the type of business I'm going to buy, right? So, all right. I see a business for sale. I engage them. To me, I think my first steps would be to reach out to you and say, hey, Marla, I'm looking at buying this manufacturing business, right? Can can you help me with uh, judging if their processes and everything is in place? Mm -hmm. Is that a good use to, to bring you on board? Absolutely. Okay. So there are very specific questions that would get asked. I mean, you, you can tell right away if a company is kind of operating by the seat of their pants or if they really have a a real risk-based process approach to what they're doing. They really have some discipline in it, really. Okay. And you can always tell by their reputation as well. You can just ask them, uh, what are your customer satisfaction ratings? Are, are your customers using you because they don't have a choice? Or are they buying from you because they really like you? I always use the example of my internet provider. I absolutely hate them. But because I send them a check every month, they think I like them. And that's not true. I just don't have options. Second, I second that. I hate, I've hated all of my internet providers, all of my Comcast, you might as well call them crooks, and Xfinity, another set of crooks. <laughs> you know, they show how their customers feel about them, and even how their suppliers feel about working with them. They don't care, because they're Monopoly. 
Yeah, you, you can get a really good idea of what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. What else we have in here? Earn and learn virtual happy hour. Hey, Maria, that's pretty cool. I don't know if you realize what she did. Can you see Maria's post, Marla? Let me see. Let me go back. Take a look at Maria's post. So she has the guy doing like this. But oh, because yeah. she has a wine glass, it looks like he has legs to him. <laughs> do you see that? <laughs> do you guys see that way? Or do, am I the only one to see it that way on my screen? It looks like his little character has legs. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Someone said, I stopped a second. I just dropped AT&T. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're, all these all these guys, these companies are terrible. All right, so I'm looking at buying uh, this this manufacturing company. We reach out. We talk to their clients. Good company. All right. Now, I have them, and we want to, and again, I'm thinking the same like GovCon brain here. So we want to go after uh, specific types of opportunities. How do we determine which ISO we need, or is that something that you do? Yeah, I can help them figure that out because it does kind of depend on the product mix. Okay, if you're just general manufacturing, commercial, aerospace, it doesn't matter. ISO 9001 is great, even with services, even if it's not a product. If it's just general, 9001 is a great place to start. If you're very specifically going to focus on aerospace or military or DOD, you probably need to go ahead and get AS9100. What if I was making car parts? All right, so that's a whole other animal. That now, is now, let me, let me, when I say car, maybe more like military vehicles, parts, I should say, instead of cars. It's still AS9100. It's oh, still AS9100. Okay, so cars is just different, totally, if you say a car. Yes, yeah, specific to the automotive industry, that's called IATF 16949. That is also based on ISO 9001, but it's a lot more stringent. Personally, I think automotive is harder than aerospace. Person. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Eric Canales says, Marla, do you attend DOD symposiums to meet like-minded people and manufacturers? Uh, I used to before COVID, yes. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> yes, I've attended conferences my entire career, absolutely. Uh, engineering conferences, DOD conferences. I worked for a DOD co uh, contractor, prime contractor for 13 years. So I went to every conference I could find because, you know, it was free. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's that CBD oil, Young Swoops. Uh, Marla, uh, Mo's asking, have you connected with Dean Kivett? No, and Garrett, I think you mentioned D to me as well. I will connect. I will. Didn't you have that person on before? Yeah, like, yeah. she was on, yes. And she teaches some trainings at a university. She's one of our oh, podcast yeah. guests. Yeah, yeah, I will definitely connect with her. I saw somebody asked about training. I do training, absolutely. Um, my master's degree is in training. That's what I actually wanted to do with my life at some point. <laughs> uh, but I love taking really complicated stuff and making it really easy. That's probably what attracted me to go kind of giant. Because oh, okay. we took something very complicated and ridiculous but made it pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of how I think, too. Make it simple. That's true. That's true. I think I'm just silly all the time, but that's just me. <laughs> well, my clients will tell you, yeah, we have a lot of fun on this job. Yeah. That's good. No, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I think that we have to have fun. We have to uh, enjoy a lot more than we do. We uh, One of the things that we talked about today with Judy and I was how very little uh, we as people celebrate and that we should celebrate more often. And that's really the reason why we're doing this tomorrow, earn and learn session, um, virtual happy hour, just because I think we should celebrate all of the people's accomplishments because a lot of these, again, and I know how excited Mo you were when you got your contract. Uh, and I'm a lot of times the first person receiving the text message or the call, maybe second um, after their wife or significant other. But I know people are, some people are crying, uh, there's a lot of emotions involved around that. And I think that we should, as a community, also celebrate them and not just let that moment pass. Let them be able to celebrate that amongst people who care and people who really um, watch them and their journey and, and you know, watch it kind of unfold live. 
uh, Marla, you know Chris in the back with the guitars and stuff. And, you know, yeah, yeah. so I mean, uh, it's just kind of really neat to see each other. In fact, funny thing is, my son called me today and uh, he said, and I was going to tell the story. He called me today and he's like, Dad, he said, I, I got two stories to tell you. He said, one's really, really good. And then one's, and you exist. You know, all the stuff that I say, right? All the stuff that we talk about, the October video that we just released. Um, and the guy says, he says, no, no, that's good. That's good. He goes, uh, he says, so what can you do for me? And he starts telling him, hey, I could do this. I could do this. He goes, all right, when do you want to meet? And he set up a meeting. And so he's, it, it's really, he said, you know, he said to me, he said, dad, um, I've been on these calls. I've been listening to these videos. He's like, I'm, I'm sick and tired. And, of, and he goes, I'm happy for other people's success, but I want my own story. I want my own interview. I want to, you know, I want to have a reason for you to interview me too, not just listening or vicariously through somebody else. And like he reminded me in some of my previous videos, we have all of the information we just need to do. We don't need more information. We need to start taking action and doing the activities. And that's where a lot of people are falling short. I mean, th this kid literally tried his first time and out of three people, he has a meeting with one person. He didn't, he's like, it took less than an hour. He goes, yeah, I spent half the day doing research, like figuring out which companies to call and, you know, comparing what they have and what they don't have. But for all of you listening, um, we're talking, you know, we're talking about someone who doesn't know anything about government contracting. He's been interning with us for a month. He's, but he's, he is on all the calls. He's on the Tuesday calls. He's on the Monday masterminds. He's watching the videos. He's editing the videos. And Maria said it. She learned by editing my content. So if anyone wants to to really emerge in this, learn by doing, by helping, by editing. And um, that's how he learned it. He picked the phone and call. He's like, look, if Maria saved up enough money to buy her house, he said, I'm going to save up enough money to buy me a house. And and that's really, um, that was really it. And, you know, he was inspired. I took him out this weekend. We went on a boat, drove up the intercoastal, uh, and we talked about it. Like, hey. You know, you don't have to, you know, this doesn't have to be a dream. You know, this is, could be reality. So he, it, it caused, I always say people, uh, that two, one of two reasons that they actually do something, inspiration or desperation. And I guess he was inspired and he was like, look, let me, let me start getting this thing going. So just kind of a quick story and he'll, and he'll talk about it tomorrow. So he will, um, he'll bring that up tomorrow in, uh, the, uh, Tuesday call. So yeah, question. Cool too with the cause is that it's not always the end game isn't always to just win a contract right okay for some people it is right but there's a lot of other things that happen like i mentioned i like to focus on machine shops so i started down one path i quickly learned that everybody can't do everything there are a lot of clients who say oh yeah i want to do government work i want to sell my two dollar screw for fifty dollars but then when you actually present them with the opportunity and what they have to do sometimes they choke and I learned that the hard way. I put a lot of work into it because I'm following the Gov contract training, right. the GovCon training. I'm doing it all. And sometimes you come up with nothing. But it's not a, it's not a failure. No. You're learning that maybe that's just not the right client. Right. That's all. Right. 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 So right. Absolutely. Um, someone says, do you if assembled in house, do you need to have the same ISO as the manufacturer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because again, we're certifying the process. Right. So we don't want to just, you know, cross our fingers that whatever we're assembling is going to come out right every time. We have a lot of processes in place until you get to the point where you assemble it, box it, and ship it. So you'll be certifying all of those processes. Yes. Okay. Um, Maurice Spears says, I'm getting the wholesaling. Does a wholesaler work with the manufacturer or just distributors? It depends. It, it really does depend. A lot of wholesalers absolutely go straight to the distributor, but depending on what it is, if you want that manufacturer or someone to add value, so let's say, for instance, I'll pick on the mask, okay? If you make them in bulk and you send 50,000 to a place, but now you want them to label them individually, you want them to put a serial number on it, to package it or all that stuff, now they're adding value so the wholesaler doesn't necessarily have to be ISO certified, but they should have a quality management system. But who's selling it? Yeah, they definitely should have one. Because again, if something goes wrong, they're going to call who they bought it from. 
And then in turn, that whole that distributor might call the wholesaler with their names on it. MTP says, do government training materials like this, online, book packages, all those things, do they need certs? And again, I know, I mean, I know, I know you said we're not certifying the products, but someone, I guess, someone providing the, that type of material, that learning material. Yeah, <coughs> so it's a process, absolutely. So let's say you want to develop a new course, Eric. Okay, um, do you just haphazardly do it? Are you using templates? Do you have a syllabus? Do you have an audience? There's going to be something that's standard in how you develop everything, whether it's an online training, a video, or whatever it is. And you would get certified to that process that you use to lay out what that product is going to look like. Because you know what you what you know what the end game is supposed to be. You know what your end product is supposed to be. We're going to certify how you get there, and it's consistent every single time. Someone says, "Do you teach this certification, and what are your fees?" Yeah, so we can certainly talk about fees offline. <laughs> but yeah, I can I can teach someone like how to be an auditor. Let's say that. Okay. okay. If you want to learn ISO 9001 and all of this stuff, um, that's really easy. I can certainly show you that. If you want to learn how to be a consultant, like creating the quality management system and taking a company from I have no idea what to do to actually getting certified, I can absolutely show you how to do that. That's the funnest part of my day. Okay. All right. Good stuff. All right, Marla. Um, anybody else have anything else for Marla? Anyone else? Just contact me. All right. Well, let me, I'm going to drop her info back on the screen for those of us to see. Anyone have anything for me? Because when I, I'm going to let Marla go, I'm going to go too. Good. All hearts are clear. All right. Well, I guess we will see everyone tomorrow um, on our happy hour, right? We're going to see everyone tomorrow on happy hour. Uh, Marla's email. Marla, you didn't put your email up. Info at AQPNP.com. Okay. Hold on. So say it again. Info at a Q P N B. All right. Can you com. type it in the chat and let me just drop it in there for everyone so that they can just copy and paste. Um, I like people that do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mo, you email questions for Marla. Let me see. Hold on. Mo said he emails questions. Let me see. Nope. Don't see him, Mo. So they haven't come in yet, buddy. All right. Um, I'm going to show these messages and then we're logging off. We will talk to you soon. All right. There it is. Thanks, Marla. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This okay. Is great. All right. I had a lot of fun. As always, it's a pleasure. See, it wasn't that bad. No, it's great. <laughs> hey guys, listen, thank you so much uh, for joining tonight. We I have not yet put up next week's live session, but I will be doing that shortly. Obviously, we've been really busy. Uh, so if you have any questions for Mala, please reach out. Again, listen, we have to, uh, and I always say this, and I just kind of have to remind it because y'all gonna y'all call me preacher Eric, but in order to really be effective at this, we've got to get ahead of the curve. We cannot wait for things to happen to us. We can't sit idly by while, while opportunities are coming up and passing us. We should be watching the news, not to complain, not to fight, not to argue about who's doing what, but let's figure out what are the needs that the government's expressing? What are the underlying problems and issues that need solving? That's one of the reasons why I think that you should watch the news. If at, if at all, like I really don't think you should, but if you are, listen to the issues that are coming up. I'm going to tell you a um, funny story. I was listening to 60 Minutes last night. That's one of my shows I like. And I don't know if anyone saw the episode of 60 Minutes last night. Um, and by the way, there's a point to the story. This is These uh, ex-Republican strategists formed a pact 
where they start making um, these 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 videos uh, against Donald Trump. Um, and it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. What I heard was uh, that they raised sixty million dollars to make this. So if we want to talk about getting contracts and opportunities and finding a way to use what's in the moment as a way to generate business for your company. All of you people out here who told me, Eric, I am a social media expert. I'm a graphics person. I'm a marketing person. You could have been that on that super PAC. You could have been with that type of group of people. And you have been the beneficiary recipients of making content for the election, content for media. And none of their stuff is on TV. All their stuff is posted to Facebook and social media platforms. They were man, They managed to raise $60 million. Okay. So what do you think about, again, that's to me as an example of someone looking at the timing, right? Because everything is about timing and saying, okay, this is the timing, right? This is the, they're having situational awareness and saying, how do we capitalize on this timing? And so they happen to do it in that particular way. And again, maybe that's not for everyone, and I and it it may seem like it's not related to government contract, but it is to me in a standpoint because um, there are other people that are on the other side that are making videos that are anti those content, right? But again, Marla, it's more money being dumped either which side you're on, and really that's the same thing that uh, we talked about last Tuesday that I'm doing with FEMA and Operation Warp Speed. We're looking at the momentary situation, right? There's disasters happening. There's hurricanes happening. And how do we how do we play a larger role in these events to help, you know, drive sales, to increase business and all that kind of stuff? So um, I just want to say that this particular topic really um, two years from now, when we start having all this manufacturing, you're going to have to go back and say, well, that video is old. Well, because you didn't do it at the time. <laughs> None of the content was old at the time that I made the videos. It's just old when you took advantage of it. So don't let this video sit stale and just say, hey, that's another learning lesson. I'll store it in my you know, database for later. Definitely uh, think about how you can apply this and how you can um, take some of the ideas that we talked about and find out, okay, how can I capitalize on the moment that we're in today? One of my guests today said he used to work at a tampon factory. One of our GovCon students, her first contract was selling feminine products to the government. There's correlations here, folks. Okay, there's correlations. You have to see it. Uh, write down 10 ideas. I want to encourage everyone, write down who's hung around. There's still 42 people left watching. Write down 10 ideas in which you think you can manufacture or be connected with a manufacturer and bring that to the government space for areas that we need. That is huge. Uh, DLA is a big proponent of reverse engineering products. And so there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, trust me, uh, everything that I do is with intention. I didn't bring Marla on here because of her pretty face and her nice personality. I wanted her to come on here to teach you how to, to best utilize this information and take advantage of it because I see this happening more and more in the future and we're going to need a lot more people involved. And I would love for it to be someone who's been following me, watching me, learning from me, rather than people that are not. So with that, thank you guys for your time. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Marlon, for showing up. And we're mm -hmm. going to sign off. Bye.